Thanks, Rich. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along. Um, hopefully, you'll find something interesting here. Hopefully, I will too. Um, this is um, a paper that is a bit rough and ready, so all comments are very welcome. Uh, okay, so um, I guess the starting point for this paper is what uh, is, in a sense, whatever happened to um, e voting. What's the picture of seeing? Uh, you know, this is ancient history. So back in the 1962 and 1963, 1964, Hanna Barbera, as well as making the Flintstones, made a kind of a, a matching program, which is called the Jetsons. And um, uh, I'll get uh, Stuart to sing the theme song for you later on, because um, he'll no doubt remember it. I remember watching it uh, as a child after school, and this was a futuristic um, society set in 2062, I think it's a century after when it was um, created, and everything was modern, and you have a, you know, a robot made, and you have all these machines that will do things that uh, we uh, certainly couldn't do in the 1960s. Um, many of them we can do now, but e-voting, in a sense, hasn't been one of them. Um, and it's kind of a puzzle. You know, we do so many things with, uh, you know, um, uh, smartphones, with uh, tablets, with um, computer technology and so on. But electronic voting really hasn't developed as quickly as many experts um, uh, might have predicted. Uh, it's been much patchier and um, there are all sorts of big ways in which it's been patchier. So some countries sort of took it up very very quickly and did pilots and then they just kept on doing pilots on and off for the last couple of decades and Colombia is an example of that. They did a first voting pilot in 1992 and then at the in, in 2012 the Colombian electoral management body said oh we're going to have um, electronic voting by the 2014 elections, and guess what? 2014 elections came, and all ballots were cast on paper. Um, so, uh, and then after the election, the uh, election, electoral management body said, well, we're going to keep going with pilots of electronic voting. So they don't give up on the idea, but unable to uh, implement it. Other governments have rejected electronic voting in response to various um, uh, pressure group activity, legal challenges, technical failures, um, negative press, uh, and, and, and the like. Um, in 2014, in the most recent example, and I'm glad I looked this up, otherwise I would have put Norway somewhere differently in, my, in the tables that you'll see later on in this paper, after a series of what were generally thought to be reasonably successful pilots, uh, Norway uh, in July this year decided that it was going to um, end those pilots, uh, that it wasn't going to go down the e-voting path. There were concerns about privacy for voters, um, secrecy of the ballot, there were concerns about um, uh, the failure of e-voting to increase turnout, which was one of the goals, you know, introduce e-voting and more people will, will vote because it's more convenient, particularly young people. Um, and that was kind of funny because at the same time the UK government, or at least some figures, uh, relevant figures in, in UK politics, announced that the UK was, you know, ought to think again about electronic voting. So the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko, uh, said, you know, we ought to have e-voting in this country, it's you know, part of being a modern country. And the uh, Electoral Commissioner, whose name escapes me for the moment, Jenny Watson, um, uh, said, you know, yeah, we ought to reform the electoral system, let's, let's, let's do some e-voting pilots. Now, the interesting thing is that as the UK is sort of saying, let's do these pilots, Norway is saying, let's not do these pilots, a decade ago the UK had a whole series of pilots and they abandoned them for pretty much the same reasons that the Norwegians did a couple of months ago. In other words, they were supposed to raise turnout, as Pippa Norris, among other people, showed that didn't happen. Uh, they the pilots were more or less high quality. Some of the ones at the end were pretty low quality and not surprisingly, uh, these were pilots in local government elections and not surprisingly there were some integrity issues in terms of uh, the security of the, of the ballot and so on. So there's this kind of weird um, thing going on where you know countries are kind of dipping their toes in the water and then taking them out and then dipping them in again and, and so on. And yet other countries have sort of pushed ahead with e-voting. So Belgium is a good example of this. Uh, uh, first implemented e-voting, at least in parts of the country, in 1994. Um, uh, and um, 
uh, in 2014, or at least before the most recent elections in May 2014, half of the country roughly, the, um, the Flemish half, uh, updated its voting machines. The Walloon part of the country decided, no, we're going to keep using the old machines. Um, they had their elections in May 2015 for the European Parliament, National Parliament, and um, I think regional bodies. Uh, in the updated part of the country, voting proceeded without problems, not surprisingly in the parts of the country where they were still using 8086 processes, uh, which some of you who are even older than uh, me might remember from the 1980s, anarchists certainly won't remember them. But anyway, these old <laughs> processes that nobody uses anymore and computers with about one megabyte of RAM. Uh, <laughs> not surprisingly, these, the, you know, there was a glitch in these, in these computers. Um, it wasn't a critical glitch in the sense that it was easily rectified and the count could proceed, there was a backup uh, system and so on. The Belgian government seemed to say, you know, sort of response to this was, Let's, we're, we're just going to keep going. So there's sort of different trajectories is what I'm saying. Some, some uh, governments sort of not interested at all, you know, there's a whole list of governments and we'll see some of them later on that just not interested at all, others trials and then abandon, others sort of constant trials, others sort of much more definitive moves um, one way or the other. So there's no single trajectory for <coughs> e-voting policies um, and part of what I want to do in this paper is to try and explain um, why that might be, some of the factors, and particularly the role of integrity issues in um, uh, decisions by governments to introduce e-voting, to maintain, to expand it, and, and to abandon it, and see if we can find some kind of patterns there. Of course, I'm aware that it's not just ideas that determine whether or not um, uh, policies get um, introduced or, or rejected, uh, ended, replaced. Um, there's also, you know, other, uh, other things that are important, I mean, judicial or legal challenges are important in the case of Germany, for example. Um, E-voting was ended because of a, well, for the moment at least, <laughs> because of a judicial uh, constitutional challenge which said that, you know, elections had to be public um, events and that e-voting uh, didn't meet that standard of, uh, of uh, publicness. Um, there are questions of technical capacity, in other words, you know, there have been uh, you know, governments can't just say let's have e-voting and then it'll suddenly happen. There has to be the technical capacity to to introduce it successfully and countries may decide just not to do it because they lack that technical capacity or fear that they will. They may simply have other priorities. In other words, there may be other things that the governments want, governments want to spend their money on. You know, if you've got an existing uh, electoral system, replacing it costs money, uh, you know, Money is in short supply. We want to we want to spend money on other other sorts of things. So there's there's not just ideas, it's not just sort of the <coughs> competing integrity claims that are important uh, here, but uh, those kinds of competing claims are what I want to focus on in this in this uh, paper um, because I think they are important. Um, so what I'm looking at is the in this paper centrally is the impact of concerns about integrity electoral integrity on different policy decisions. Um, and what I want to argue is that e-voting decisions don't seem to be driven in an automatic or straightforward way by factors like economic development or internet um, uh, or technological saturation, internet saturation in a, in a country, uh, or by uh, political rights, but they're much more of a kind of a policy choice that, that um, governments, governments make. Um, and some of those choices have to do, as I say, with things that aren't directly related with, to integrity. So, you know, the drive, the desire for modernisation is, is, a, is a repeated rationale for introducing e-voting. Um, but many of the, many of the questions, uh, many of the rationales do centre around um, uh, integrity issues. And those seem to play out differently in the two different contexts that I'm interested in looking at, that is Europe and um, uh, uh, the Americas, and particularly Central and South America. Um, and I won't, I won't tell you how they play out differently, because otherwise you'll stop listening and <laughs> just sort of eat and look at, look at your watches. So um, let's, uh, let's try to stop that from happening too, too much. Um, okay, so what do I mean by e-voting? Uh, just to get this kind of maybe boring but essential definitional question kind of out of the way. 
Um, there are obviously a number of ways in which uh, electronic processes can be used in various aspects of um, uh, elections and indeed more broadly in political participation. E-voting is, is refers to a kind of a relatively narrow um, subgroup of those uh, processes. So I, I define it as follows, not very original, but you know, um, refers to occasions on which a voter directly records his or her preferences using an electronic device, such as a specifically designed electronic voting machine. Um, this is an example of a Smartmatic machine. We'll be talking about Smartmatic later on. Computer terminal, so a generic computer terminal through which you can vote. Personal computer connected to the internet, a tablet or a telephone. So you can see that there's, there's different sorts of voting involved. It might be supervised electronic voting. In other words, you still have to go to a polling place and there are a set of um, machines set up for you to vote on. Or it might be unsupervised. In other words, you can vote from your own home or you can vote on a, you know, you can vote on a phone or a tablet. Um, that the latter, the latter type of unsupervised or remote um, uh, electronic voting is often called internet voting or i-voting. I'm just running the two of them together. I know there are some distinctions um, between them, particularly amongst people who are concerned with sort of security uh, and privacy of the ballot, but for the purpose of the discussion today, I'm mostly talking about e-voting as encompassing both of those um, types of, of, of voting. Um, so, how widespread is e-voting? My kind of goal by this stage of thinking about e-voting was to know where e-voting was taking place around the world. Um, I haven't achieved that goal, um, partly because of some difficulties with the research, but also partly because of some difficulties with e-voting itself. Um, as I've already kind of indicated in the case of Norway, it's sometimes difficult to know who's doing e-voting and who's not. Um, there are questions, there are two, I think, important questions that might lead you to some different answers um, about, you know, where voting is taking place in the world. One has to do with scope. In other words, how much e-voting does there have to be before you say a country is doing e-voting? Um, so many of the countries that we're going to, or a number of the countries that we're going to look at have e-voting, but it's confined to relatively small groups of voters. It's not the dominant form of, of voting. Um, or it may be um, uh, limited to particular levels of election. So a local government election, Canada is a really good example of this, uh, Holly. So, um, you know, you have e-voting in Canada, right? I just found that up when I was reading you the found paper. That when you're reading the paper. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's learned something. My work here is done. Uh, um, you have e-voting in, in Canada, uh, but it's, a, it's basically in, in a small number of municipalities, yeah. and they've been doing it pretty well and for some time and so on and so forth, but it's not at the provincial level, it's not at the national level, so does it really count as e-voting or not, you know? Um, trials, if, even, if, even if they, you know, if, if a few thousand voters use electronic voting machines and those votes are counted in election, um, does, it, does, it, does it count or does it need to be broader than that? So scope is one kind of issue here. Um, Another issue is, you know, unlike a lot of policies, elections, uh, the policies only have to be implemented once every three or four years, right? So, you know, social security policy, or taxation policy, it's being implemented all the time. We know what the government's, we can find out what the government's policies are and, and the way that, that they're implementing them at any one time. Elections are a bit different, happen every three or four years. That's a lot of time for governments to sort of say, yeah, we're going to have e-voting and, and we've even, you know, we've passed the legislation, we've even bought the machines and then a couple of, you know, weeks before the election they go, hey, you know what, we're not going to have e-voting. Um, and the classic case of that or a classic case of that that I like to talk about a lot, not because I don't like the Irish, but is the Irish case. So, you know, the Irish Prime Minister uh, says, we're going to have e-voting. They do a trial, they pass the legislation, they buy the machines famous need out machines that nobody likes uh, and then there's objections from um, uh, tec technical experts, there are objections from, from citizen groups, there's a lot of controversy in the press and so they go back to paper voting. Those machines were never used. If you heard in the paper I gave you 18 months ago about this, um, they were never used, they were eventually sold for scrap. Right? They tried to give them away to schools. <laughs> School said, no, we can't use these, they're voting machines, they're not, they're not computers, don't pretend that you're giving us computers, uh, <laughs> give us something useful instead. And so they eventually they were sold for, for scrap. So, you know, it's really, my broader point here is it's, it's often very difficult to know 
um, because elections only take place every so often, uh, whether a country has e-voting or not. It may well say that it has, it may well run some trials, but whether um, it has or not can only be discovered at an election. Even Norway, I mean, they've said, you know, we're not doing trials at the moment, but they may change in their mind before the next election, you know, change of government, change of, change of um, uh, uh, parliamentary representation, change of the decision makers may well make a difference. So it's often tricky to tell how much e-voting there is. I'm reasonably confident, although if there are country specialists in the audience, I'm happy to be corrected with the, um, uh, with the data that I have on, um, uh, I've made it too small for you to be able to read. That's a tricky plan. You can't disagree with something you can't see um, with these countries. So I focused on Europe and uh, South America, or America, the Americas rather, not just South America, Central America, North America. Um, by my research, probably about two-thirds, around about two-thirds of countries in those two continental regions haven't ever um, done any voting. No experiments, no trials, no implementation. Um, uh, there's a, a larger group of countries, mostly you'll see in Europe, Austria, Finland, Ireland, Italy, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Romania, and the United Kingdom, which have had e-voting trials or pilots uh, or full use of e-voting but have discontinued it. Um, Any Paraguay in, in the Americas. Ongoing e-voting pilots, we see a lot more of them in um, <coughs> Central and South America in particular. So Antigua and Barbuda, Argentina, Costa Rica, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama and Peru. And then we see some countries uh, reasonably evenly split, Belgium, Estonia, France and Switzerland in Europe which have ongoing use of e-voting of some kind in Brazil, Canada, the United States, and Venezuela, and the Americas. Um, so there's a reasonably similar breakdown uh, there. Um, so the difference is really here. Do you have <coughs> pilots or e-voting and then discontinue it as in the European uh, case, that big bunch of countries, or, or just keep on having pilots often, but you know, as in the case of Colombia, for, for decades at a, at a time. Um, so there's a, you know, accepting my sort of rather loose definition of which countries have e-voting, so including countries like Canada, where it's only in, really only in three or four municipalities, or Colombia, where it's a series of trials, or Argentina for that matter, you know, a number of these countries. Um, there's been, uh, there are enough countries to talk about, um, but not a majority. Uh, most countries um, in, in, in both regions have just said e-voting meh. We're not really that enthused by the idea. We, we, we're not going to put resources uh, into it or whatever. So um, that's the kind of the pattern. Uh, the next part of the paper tries to make the argument that the difference between these countries that have tried e-voting and the countries that have never tried e-voting doesn't have to do with wealth or um, uh, technological advancement or political rights. Um, it's, it's, it has to do with deliberate sorts of policy choices. So e-voting is not really a necessity. Um, it's a um, it's a uh, it's a policy um, choice. It's not a necessary outcome of development if, if we want to put it in those sorts of terms. And there's a picture of just to make this point. There's a picture of which I think I might have used before of a Brazilian uh, native Brazilian voting using an electronic voting machine in a remote part of, of Brazil. So Brazil, one of the countries most committed to, um, uh, to e-voting uh, with um, you know, fairly limited um, uh, uh, technological, uh, economic, um, and, and indeed political rights. Um, so what can we say about this? So there is one of the possible economic, <coughs> technological, and political determinants. There may be a whole range of these. I've thought fairly crudely in terms of wealth, um, technological capacity, uh, political rights. Um, so we've got some data on gross domestic product, on household internet access, and, and on political rights to show you. I've presented it very crudely, so there are no kind of fine-grained correlations here or um, uh, that kind of thing. And the reason that I've done that is should be fairly obvious from the kind of crudeness of the of the um, 
uh, observations. Um, in other words, I wouldn't want to put you know, too much store on fine grain differences <laughs> between countries that, that have sort of fairly um, different sorts of um, uh, e-voting um, practices in any case. So these are broad categories. There are also snapshots in 2013, 2014. So in other words, I haven't tried to work out you know, what was the GDP of Colombia relative to the rest of the, the world when Colombia first introduced um, e-voting. Uh, that didn't seem to me to be a particularly <laughs> valuable use of time. Um, my assumption is that the countries, because the categorizations are broad, they'll pretty much stay in those categories for long periods of time. And in any case, I'm, I'm interested in countries that have currently uh, rejected e-voting, having used it, countries that are currently not picking it up at all, and, and so on. So there didn't seem to be much um, point at this stage, at least, going beyond those kinds of snapshots um, that I'm about to, to present. So there's some caveats to the data, and no doubt people who are interested in um, data will have plenty of criticism of those um, decisions. But to make some decisions. Um, okay, so here's kind of wealth, e-voting and economic wealth. Um, the first of our um, measures around is, a, is e-voting kind of in some sense determined by, um, you know, broad structural factors. Is it determined by wealth? Um, and these are the poorer countries down here, at least as measured by GDP. So less than 5,000 US dollars per capita. Um, and these are the richest countries up here, over 50,000. GDP per capita um, uh, US dollars per year, 2013 figures. Um, these are the countries in the middle. And we find that sort of the poorest, for the poorest countries, e voting isn't really a priority, probably beyond their means. They've got other things to do, although we find at least Paraguay and Armenia um, have, uh, Paraguay has had an e voting program that it discontinued, and Armenia has ongoing pilots. But it doesn't take, you don't have to be far out of this sort of poorest group of countries before you find much more significant experimentation with uh, electronic voting and indeed some pretty committed um, moves. So gross domestic product of five to 10,000 US per capita, <coughs> Bulgaria, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and Peru, ongoing pilots, 10 to 20,000, another bunch of countries, um, including Brazil, Estonia, and Venezuela, which are interesting because they're the countries, the three countries, uh, at least out of this group, which have the universal e-voting. In other words, the dominant way, the almost universal way that people vote in, uh, no, no, that's not true for Estonia, sorry, Brazil and Venezuela, I should say. So Brazil and Venezuela, it's only when the machines break down, which they very rarely do, that um, people cast paper votes. Estonia, sorry, I was confusing myself, Estonia has a very strong commitment to um, um, so we find you know, this bunch of countries here, and then amongst the, the richer uh, countries, you find this kind of bifurcation between countries which have ongoing use of e-voting, Belgium, France, United States, Switzerland, Canada, and those which have had pilots or use and discontinued a much, much kind of larger, larger group. Um, at the same time, there's this kind of big group of countries at all levels that just don't, you know, are indifferent to to electronic voting, so Bermuda, Denmark, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Monaco and Sweden, amongst the richest countries here, just not, um, not interested. So um, it doesn't seem to be related to uh, wealth. Um, the wealthiest countries' experimentation with um, e-voting is, is more common, but so is discontinuing uh, e-voting. So there does seem to be this kind of difference between countries in this band and countries in this band on that, in that regard. You get a very similar pattern with internet access, no doubt because there's some kind of you know, collinearity between internet access um, in a country and its, and its wealth. So this is household internet access in 2013, countries with the least internet access, not much e-voting, but again, you only need to get up into the 20s and 30s percent of households having internet access to find at least some, and you certainly don't need universal or anywhere near universal um, internet access to sort of be thinking about uh, e-voting among the countries with the highest levels of um, internet access. Again, this is kind of bifurcation between countries which have ongoing use of e-voting and countries which have used 
that I'm uh, giving it up. Um, the situation with political rights is kind of uh, a little bit, perhaps even more um, uh, open-ended. Um, you might on the one hand think about um, e-voting as being a kind of almost like a luxury item. So in other words, you get the basic political rights in a country firmly established and then you think about, okay, we've got people with disabilities who find it hard to vote, hard, hard to cast a secret ballot if that secret ballot is on paper, right? So if you've got uh, vision impairment, if you're blind, you're going to need somebody to read out the, um, uh, the candidates to you and to write down your response if you're using a paper ballot. Um, relatively small group of people in most countries. Or you've got remote voters, far away from polling places, really hard for them to vote, so they don't vote. Um, so, you know, it's a sort of a marginal kind of um, uh, um, violation of, not for the people, individuals concerned, it's a big violation for them to have to tell someone else who, who they're voting for or not to be able to vote. But in terms of the overall country, it's probably relatively marginal, right? So you might think, okay, what we need to do is establish some really basic, fundamental political rights first, and then e-voting becomes a kind of icing on the cake, if you like, or a kind of a final uh, element in, in, in establishing political rights. And that would suggest that countries with you know, already well-established um, political rights will be the ones that then start looking at um, e-voting. Um, alternatively, you might uh, think that, well, those countries might also be suspicious that having established high levels of political rights that e-voting may corrode at least some of them. In other words, if there are questions around the security of the vote, you know, its capacity to produce miscounts, its capacity to uh, perhaps and then therefore disenfranchise people by their vote not being counted or being counted incorrectly, um, or uh, its capacity to, in the case, for example, of internet voting, to open up voting to coercion. You know, in other words, I'm voting at home, how do we know that you know, my uh, father isn't looking over my shoulder and saying that's the candidate you should vote for. Um, uh, it may, you know, it may be seen as something that corrodes um, uh, strong rights. By the same token, if uh, e-voting can be used to steal elections, then it might be attractive to authoritarian governments who don't want to respect the popular will and want to stay in power. So let's use e-voting, let's corrupt the, um, the e-voting um, algorithm that counts the vote, to make sure that our party always wins, no matter what the people people think. So there's kind of competing logics here. Um, alternatively, thinking about countries with l sort of weaker uh, uh, political rights, e-voting might be seen as a way of actually sort of pushing up those those rights by enfranchising voters. Um, in other words, vote, uh, places where you know with high levels of um, illiteracy, uh, filling out a paper ballot correctly might be really hard. Um, particularly, for example, you have to write the name of the candidate that you prefer um, uh, on the ballot paper. And so an e-voting system which presents people with much more um, easy to recognise uh, cues about voting, face of the candidate, party symbol or whatever, and requires them to uh, you know, touch a screen or, or indicate a choice for that candidate without too many um, uh, difficult instructions and, and without any necessity to write might be seen as a way of kind of boosting uh, political rights. Um, Brazil is, a, is an example of this where um, some research you know, has shown that uh, e-voting has actually you know, improved um, uh, the numbers of votes counted and particularly amongst areas where illiteracy is very high, lowered the capacity of local um, uh, elites to control how people vote uh, or, or control the outcome, rather, of elections by, you know, throwing out uh, ballots, you know, saying, oh, that ballot there, I can't really read what this person's saying, so we'll just discard that one. Um, uh, the e-voting the, the system may well boost rights, uh, some political rights, it's not a magic bullet, but some political rights in countries with low, with low um, existing rights. And the pattern kind of might indicate that both of these things are at work. So you may have these countries up here, that have piloted e-voting and then discontinued it. <coughs> are they responding to those kinds of fears? These are, these are the countries with the most established um, rights, at least according to Freedom House, or Trust Freedom House. Uh, these countries down here, lots of ongoing uh, pilots. Um, we even find e-voting in some countries with, with 
very low um, political rights generally. Armenia, Russia with ongoing e-voting pilots and Venezuela with a, with a full e-voting system. So the pattern is, it's again sort of um, much more open perhaps than we might, than we might expect. Um, the next part of the paper, sorry, I should have checked how long I was meant to talk for, should I? Half an hour to 40 minutes. Okay, so, yeah, okay, good, right. So the next part of the paper um, looks more squarely at the way that it, um, uh, integrity questions or integrity issues are used as an element in policy debates. If, if those policy debates are reasonably open, if electronic voting is a choice um, that countries can or can't make, then integrity um, elements, integrity issues uh, often emerge as a key part of those um, debates. Uh, and uh, there's been some attempt to develop international standards around e-voting by uh, bodies such as the Council of Europe or IFES and um, International IDEA and, and the like. And these standards are when you look at them, pretty sensible. So an e-ballot must be universal, in other words, everyone should have access to it, it should be equal, um, it should be free from manipulation, uh, it should allow a secret vote. Um, the e-voting system has to be transparent at the same time, you've got to be able to verify the results, um, it has to be reliable, and it has to be secure. So, you know, these are, these are all reasonably straightforward and um, in some ways, uh, and quite defensible um, principles and standards, uh, but there, I would suggest that there are some problems in the way that they're mobilised, um, at least at present. Um, uh, sorry, this is, a, this is an Estonian voter using the Estonian iVoting uh, system. I guess she's meant to be at home, maybe she's at her workplace, kind of voting where it's convenient. Uh, what's this? this is a Belgian voter. Um, voting using the Belgian system. What are some of the limitations in the ways that these standards are applied? I think there are three important ones. One, they're often presented in absolute terms. And I think that's a problem um, because it means that even minor uh, discrepancies in e-voting elections, so the Belgian case would be a good case, you know, some minor problems in the count, oh, that means that we shouldn't have e-voting because uh, the e-voting system wasn't um, entirely uh, reliable. You know, there was a minor problem, is it's not reliable, uh, we shouldn't have it. Um, that's the way that e-voting opponents often, particularly computer um, science, um, uh, cyber security type people present um, their objections to e-voting. Um, uh, or the failures might be potential rather than actual. In other words, you know, we haven't shown that there are any failures, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any, and so if it's not going to live up to these high standards, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't have it. Um, of course, there, there, are, there are, this presents uh, other difficulties. Uh, so there's a long-standing difficulty that um, uh, computer scientists have been trying to overcome, which is having a, uh, having a fully secret e-voting system and a fully verifiable um, vote. How can you have those, those two? If you have full, verifi full verifiability, then the likelihood is you're going to be able to identify that you know, Ben Goldsmith voted for candidate X and uh, you know, Norbert Kirsten voted for candidate Y. Uh, so in other words, it violates the secrecy. If you have full secrecy, you don't allow a connection between the voters cast and the voters as counted, then it's difficult to, to have full verifiability. There's a kind of a gap. So there's a, kind of, there's a problem in thinking of, about these um, standards in absolute terms, and yet they often are thought of in, in that way. Secondly, the comparisons with paper ballots are often made in a very uneven way. Um, in other words, the assumption is that the paper ballot system works perfectly. Um, we know it does. Well, maybe we don't know it doesn't, but anyone who's talked to electoral management bodies uh, or been involved in an election will know that it doesn't. Um, they don't work uh, perfectly. Um, so there's often, even when there are comparisons made, as they have to be, because after all, the choice for um, authorities isn't between having an e-voting system or having nothing. Uh, it's a choice between types of e-voting systems and types of paper-based ballots. So a choice has to be made, and therefore the comparisons have to be even. They're often not made in that kind of uh, even way. And the third problem, which, um, uh, which is perhaps a little bit more controversial in this room, is um, because of the example I'm about to develop, is that it's hard to measure success or failure in a, in a reliable way. In other words, how do we know 
particularly comparatively, whether e-voting systems are contributing to political uh, to electoral integrity or are damaging electoral integrity. Um, and the example that I develop in the paper has to do with the two Venezuelan presidential elections of 2012 and 2013. I hasten to say I'm not an expert on Venezuelan politics. Um, I know very little about Venezuelan politics. Um, but these um, two elections, it seemed to me, six months apart, provided a good test of the, um, uh, of the use of the, um, um, the PI, the, tell me what that stands for again. Perceptions of electoral integrity. Thank you, Perceptions of Electoral Integrity <laughs> Expert Survey. <laughs> Uh, which, of course, this, uh, you know, many people in this room have an investment in. Um, sorry, I wrote it down as an acronym and that, that was silly. Because uh, I, I, I forgot. <laughs> um, perceptions of electoral integrity. So, um, why look at Venezuela, uh, particularly because I'm not an expert? First, because Venezuela is one of the, as you know by now, one of the countries that uses universal electronic voting. So it's a good test case for contribution or otherwise of electronic voting to electoral integrity. Second, because we have two observations from the perceptions of electoral integrity um, expert surveys that we, that we can look at. Uh, and thirdly, because the outcomes of the two Venezuelan presidential elections six months apart were quite different. So in October, um, yes, 2012, instant expert, uh, 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 this chappy, um, <laughs> Uh, who we all remember, fondly or not, as the case may be, Hugo Chavez won quite comfortably against uh, the main opposition candidate, uh, Nicolas... Um, no, 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 he was the replacement. Enrique Capriles. Radonsky, yes, Capriles. He won quite comfortably, 55 to 45. The next election between Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, yeah, and uh, Capriles was much, much closer, right? So it was uh, apparently 50.6% to 49.1%. Some people obviously voted for neither candidate, as you can do on the ballot paper. So much, much closer election. Both contentious elections, uh, it seems to me, uh, but the outcomes are quite, quite different. So what happens to um, e-voting and um, electoral integrity? That can, can, can we sort of glean anything from these from these two results. Um, I think we kind of can, uh, and I'll try and say something about what it is, but I guess the short story is that the PEI expert assessments, it seems to me, don't do a particularly good job of capturing um, the functioning of uh, e-voting and, um, uh, and of capturing, therefore, its contribution to electoral integrity. So let me just uh, kind of explain this. So, two elections, uh, October 2012, Chavez dies, there has to be a new election, April 2013. Uh, the overall elect integrity score for the two of them is quite different. So, in October 2012, 63.2 is the combined overall integrity score, a moderate integrity um, election according to the PEI. Uh, April 2013, it's down to 51.2. One drop of 12.1 percent, and a drop in terms of overall integrity rank from 24 places from 57 to 81. Now, lots of things go into contributing to the integrity or otherwise of an election. As I said before, an e-voting system isn't a magic bullet. We know that there's plenty of other uh, elements, um, and those of you who know Venezuelan elections will know what these are. But as I understand it, they're things like media bias, um, illegal use of uh, campaign funding and campaign uh, advertising. Uh, improper use of uh, public um, service buildings and, 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 and uh, officials to promote a vote for the, uh, for the governing party, uh, intimidation of public sector workers who don't want to vote for the, uh, for the governing party and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of problems. Electronic voting isn't going to solve them. Um, so 14th of April election, apparently much less in overall terms, had much less integrity than the October one. If we look at the um, stages of the electoral cycle, it seems to me there are two where electronic voting may have an impact. One is on the voting process, uh, and one is on the vote counting. It's fairly straightforward, voting process, you vote electronically, vote counting, there's an electronic count. Again, these turn out quite different sorts of results, so 68.8 is 
score in October down 57.4. Even more dramatic on the vote count, this kind of really surprised me, 74.8 in October. That's quite a good score, 52nd in the, out of 93 countries. But down to, what's that, eighth worst, 49.8% in April 2013. Nonetheless, there are different elements, items that go up to making these two um, uh, scales. Not all of them relate to electronic voting. So in the vote count um, scale, there are two items to do with domestic and international observers, observation teams. Venezuela has restricted access of um, <coughs> those observation teams in recent elections. Um, so the, ob the quality of the observation um, may be May not, may not be good, and you know and that it contributes to the vote count um, uh, rank. Although, how it, therefore it got its highest, seventy four point eight in October. I don't know, uh, but it's not down to just down to e-voting. So there are those four items which do look as though the e-voting system could directly contribute to them. So one is fraudulent voting. There were fraudulent votes cast. One is ease of voting. Another is the speed of the count. Uh, and uh, another is the fairness of the count. These are the four items out of uh, you know, all of the items in the, in the survey that seem to me get at whether or not the voting system in Venezuela is helping or hindering or having no effect on, um, on integrity of the election. Fraudulent voting, we see, uh, and these are scaled one to five, so it's kind of like a you know, four point scale, five point scale. Um, so fraudulent voting score drops the elections from 3.1, which isn't too bad, down to 2.3. Either voting stays pretty much the same, 4.4, 4.3. Speed of the count, which is really interesting, drops 4.6 to 2.5. And fairness of the count, again, 3.9 to 2.3. So um, the only thing that stays constant is ease of voting. Now, there could be two stories here. One is that electronic voting is relatively easy. So the score stays constant. Secondly, these are presidential elections not difficult. There are a lot of parties run, but almost all of them nominate uh, Chavez uh, or um, uh, Capriles or Maduro as their, as their candidates. In other words, you know, my party's not Chavez's party, but I support Chavez as a candidate. So it's a presidential election might be easy to vote in anyway, regardless of the voting system. Either way, um, the ease of voting score stays pretty much the same. The fraudulent voting score, why does it drop? Possibly because uh, there were complaints after the election about multiple voting. In other words, the, uh, the opposition said, you know, lots of people cast more than one vote. Um, it's not a problem, therefore, with the electronic voting per se. It's a problem with the uh, voter identification machine, which is also electronic. Uh, it's a, it's a um, what I'm looking for, biometric uh, machine. So you have to put your finger in and have your fingerprint sort of tested against uh, the previous record of your fingerprint, you have a, a code, a number that has to match up with the, with the code and so on. So there are various safeguards there, but the opposition claimed that these uh, didn't work. So maybe the, fraud, the decline in fraudulent voting has to do with increased multiple voting. I think these, these last two are really hard to um, square with any change in what happened in October and April. So the speed of the count, very high in uh, October 2012, and so it should be, because the results were announced within <coughs> about two hours of the final uh, uh, polling place closing. So you've got an electronic system, counts very quickly. Uh, the system didn't do as well the second time around in April, it took four hours. All right, but is that worth a drop of 2.1 points? I don't know. How would the Australian Electoral Commission do against this, I asked myself. Probably would be in negative territory. But anyway, my point is that uh, here two elections, same technology, very quick counts, and yet there's a very big difference here. Perhaps what's going on is that the experts are thinking about all the challenges to the results. In other words, you know, the opposition doesn't accept the results. It says, we don't accept the results, but we want a recount. A recount is, uh, is done in addition to the, the um, standard order, which involves about 50% of the, uh, the uh, polling um, machines anyway. So they do 100%, find very high level of, um, of accuracy, but maybe, maybe even so, um, uh, sorry that's fairness I'm getting onto here, but yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the point is that 
because there were challenges to the result that that's being taken into account when people say, well, the count isn't really finished yet. I mean, it is. I think it is. The count is the count, and then the later legal challenge is a different thing. So maybe people, the experts, when they're thinking about how quick was the count, they're thinking, well, how quick was the count by the time it got through to um, you know, being established? Uh, if you want to take that as, as the measure, then you have to go to August of 2013, which is when the court threw out the opposition's um, uh, case against the results of the election. Similar issue with the fairness of the count. The um, big drop here is hard to square with the fact that when the paper ballots, paper receipts are, are, um, uh, were matched against, 100% of them were matched against the, um, the electronic count, there was a 99.98 um, uh, uh, match. So the count seems to have been fair in that regard. Um, so it's really difficult to work out what's going on here. Um, it's kind of long-winded, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe it's difficult for us um, to rely on the PEI to tell us quite what's going on in terms of not just electronic voting systems, but any kind of uh, system of, of, of balloting. And what I suggest in, in the paper, I'm picking up on the suggestion that uh, Pippa and Norris and... Um, and Brian and Rich made in a paper that uh, they published in the Journal of Democracy is that there may be winners and losers effects here. That um, uh, losing candidate, uh, not losing candidates, but experts who sort of favour the losing side, uh, particularly in a close election, particularly in an election which maybe they, they see lots of other irregularities and it's really, really close, perceptions of that may bleed over into you know, much more uh, things that are far less likely to, um, or un completely unlikely to have changed. You know, the speed of the count, for example. Um, it seems to me that that might be what's going on here. Anyway, we can, we can discuss that. So um, there are some issues to think about in terms of the application of, uh, I'm running out of time, the application of um, uh, the standards and how we can really get to grips with what's going on in the in e-voting and, and the way that it is or isn't contributing to, to um, uh, electoral integrity. Final point I make has to do with context. Um, this kind of argument that I've anticipated throughout this paper seems to me that uh, context is important in whether or not countries choose to uh, introduce and then continue e-voting or whether they either don't introduce it or introduce it and then um, uh, abandon it. Um, in Central and South America, this kind of logic seems to be going on. So integrity is an important rationale for introducing e-voting. You know, in other words, e-voting is usually introduced in a context where everyone knows there's a lot of paper ballot fraud going on. So e-voting is introduced as a way of trying to reduce that. Therefore, the failures of e-voting are weighed against integrity failures of the recent past. OK, e-voting may not work perfectly, but hey, it's a hell of a lot better than the paper system we used to have. So the decisions then are to try and improve the e-voting system rather than abandoning it. And you can see that in, for example, you can see it in Venezuela, you can see it in other, um, other uh, countries. Um, in Europe, it seems to me, there tends to be a different rationale going, uh, or a different logic going on. Often e-voting is introduced not because of an integrity problem, but for other rationales, to raise the turnout, to make voting more convenient, to people more access. Um, those rationales don't have to do, or don't have a strong integrity element. They have some integrity element, but it's not really, really strong. So integrity failures, when they occur, are not weighed against failures of alternative systems. In other words, we thought the paper system was pretty good. Electronic voting can add some kind of convenience to that. Hey, electronic voting isn't working as well as we thought it could. There's some problems here. Let's 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 um, uh, let's let's. Um, uh, we, you know, we don't have a, an alternative bad system to, to measure it against. And so failure to meet particularly non-integrity goals, such as turnout, uh, makes integrity failures particularly damaging to attempts to introduce uh, electronic um, voting. And you can see that in the, in the UK case, in, in uh, Norway, in, um, in Ireland, and, and a number of the other, the other um, countries. So um, that's the kind of argument. Uh, have a range of conclusions, um, uh, which um, you can read in, in, in the paper. They pretty much flow from what I've said, that e-voting isn't a natural outcome <coughs> of a country's 
wealth or technological sophistication or political rights. Um, it's a policy choice. Integrity questions seem to be important in that choice. Um, uh, there are different logics going on, and I guess one thing that sort of might concern us, one key challenge for political scientists who are interested in this facet of electronic integrity might be working out um, better measures to compare the success and failure of um, electronic voting. So I will leave it there and um, let uh, the process continue. Great. Yeah.